If there were no mysteries in archaeology, it would take all the fun out of going in search of ancient artifacts. Fortunately, we don't have to worry about that. It's rare for an archaeologist to understand everything about the places and objects they discover. And so the quest for knowledge becomes as important as the quest for the artifact itself. Let's see what we can work out about the mysterious finds in this video. Members of the public leaving footprints or fingerprints in wet cement is an irritation for modern builders. It's also something their ancient counterparts would probably sympathize with. Here, at the Healy II archaeological site in Abu Dhabi, we see a 3,000-year-old set of fingerprints left behind on bricks. Someone touched the bricks before they were ready to be touched, and now their imprints are on them for all eternity. There's a twist in this story, though, because archaeologists think that the prints might have been left there deliberately by the person who made the brick. The dents left by the fingerprints would have been filled with mortar, helping one brick to stick to another so a solid wall could be built. Alternatively, perhaps this is just the work of a bored craftsperson making their 600th brick of the day and sticking their fingers in it purely for their own amusement. We'll never know the intention behind the act, but having someone's fingerprints makes us feel closer on a personal level to someone who's been gone for 3,000 years. Were the first settlers in America actually a lost tribe of Israel? That's the implication of the so-called Newark Holy Stones, and those who believe in the authenticity of the stones take the suggestion very seriously. In 1860, an archaeologist named David Wyrick claimed to have found the artifacts inside some ancient Native American burial mounds close to Newark, Ohio. In order, he found the keystone, the decalogue, and a stone bowl. All three items are now at the Johnson Humrick House Museum in Ohio. It's a generally accepted fact that the Newark earthworks in which the dubious artifacts were found was created by the Hopewell culture more than 1,500 years ago. The keystone is incongruous because it's inscribed with Hebrew writing, including phrases like Holy of Holies. The Decalogue was later found to contain a tiny Hebrew inscription of the Ten Commandments. However, Wyrick was a supporter of the idea of America being founded by a lost tribe of Israel long before he apparently found this evidence to support his idea. And the type of Hebrew used in the inscriptions is modern rather than archaic. It's almost certainly a fraud perpetrated by Wyrick, and not even a particularly clever one. There's a network of underground tunnels running beneath Gilmerton Cove, which is close to Edinburgh in Scotland. The tunnels are so well known to the locals that they've been open as a fun attraction for children since 2003, who think of them as little more than a playground with labyrinthine qualities. Their true history is a little darker than that. The tunnels are thought to be over 2,000 years old, and over the centuries are said to have hosted smugglers, witches, the Knights Templar, and ancient druids. The true origin of the stone tables and chairs carved directly into the rock has never been identified. A local blacksmith by the name of George Patterson claimed to have carved the tunnels himself in 1724, but it's now thought more likely that he simply rediscovered them and tried to pass the work off as his own. He only partially cleared away the rubble when he found the entrance to the tunnels, which would explain why two of them are still blocked. The design of the tunnels has more in common with Celtic traditions than anything 18th century, but regrettably, we'll probably never know for sure. There's been a recent breakthrough for archaeologists studying the Noceto Vasca Votiva in the Po Valley of Italy. The underground monument is clearly a wooden bath or tank of some kind, but has baffled experts since it was found in the early 21st century. More recently, thanks to new radiocarbon dating techniques, it's been possible to date the structure. We now know that it was made around 3,400 years ago in the Middle Bronze Age. We also know that there was once a similarly sized and shaped structure here before the current one. Traces of its crushed remains have been found underneath it. Based on the era in which it was built, archaeologists now think that the Nocetto Vasca Votiva was used in a religious water ritual. 
It would explain why the tank is built on a hillside and why apparent votive offerings have been found at the bottom of it. Those offerings include figurines and broken ceramics, typical tributes for the era. The fact that the structure exists on a hillside that would have been difficult to transport all this heavy oak to further underlines the idea of there being a superstitious or religious element to its creation. The next set of artifacts we're going to look at are known by many names. They usually go by the Tucson artifacts, but you might also have heard them called the Silver Bell artifacts, the Silver Bell Road artifacts, and the Tucson lead crosses. The 31 lead objects were said to have been found by Charles E. Manier and his family close to Picture Rocks, Arizona, USA in 1924. Most are shaped like Christian-style crosses, but there are also sword-shaped artifacts and other objects with possible religious connotations. Most shockingly of all, one of the tiny swords has a dinosaur engraved on the blade. Given the fact that the Tucson artifacts are allegedly from the 8th century, dinosaur knowledge ought to be impossible. It's also the telltale sign of a forgery. The dinosaur and the badly written Latin inscriptions on some of the other objects point to the Tucson artifacts being a hoax, but that doesn't stop believers in the Horde's authenticity, citing them as evidence of a Judeo-Christian settlement in Arizona during the 8th century. Why early Judeo-Christian settlers would be interested in dinosaurs is something they struggle to explain. The famous Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem is noted for the many thousands of tiny crosses that are carved into its walls. For many years, the crosses have been thought of as a kind of medieval graffiti created by those who worshipped in the church centuries ago. A more recent study from May 2021 challenges that idea. Based on the shape, depth, and style of each cross, experts now believe that the markings were created by a small handful of people each of whom made several hundred crosses. What they're less sure of is why. They think it's possible that the dust from the cross scrapings might have been given to pilgrims as a form of blessing, probably in return for a fee. The study also notes that most of the crosses were made in the 14th and 15th centuries, not the 11th and 12th as was once thought. The church itself is a product of the 4th century, built after the visit of St. Helena to the area. Legend has it that she identified the spot where Christ had been crucified, and that the church was built on that same spot. We've entertained several ideas about pre-Columbian visitors to the Americas so far in this video. Now, here's possible evidence of another one. This is the Yarmouth Runic Stone, sometimes also known as the Fletcher Stone. The quartzite slab was found by retired British Army surgeon Dr. Richard Fletcher on his land in Yarmouth, Nova Scotia, Canada in 1812. The faint impression of an inscription is still visible on the stone and, to some historians at least, resembles Norse runes. This could point to the arrival of Viking explorers in the area sometime close to the beginning of the 11th century. We already know that there were Vikings in Newfoundland by then. In 1934, Runology expert Olaf Strandvold translated the runes as Leif to Eric raises this monument. This was before Leif Erikson's arrival at Newfoundland was known of, so the translation could well be both accurate and significant. However, other researchers have cast doubt on Strandwold's credentials and claim the marks were made by nothing more deliberate than nature. Other people claim to have looked at these markings and seen ancient Mycenaean, Basque, and Japanese. It seems that this is a mystery without end. Stone circles are usually ascribed importance based on their age, but we don't think that's fair. Bori Kalimbuang in South Sulawesi, Indonesia might not be especially old, but it is especially interesting. There are 102 meniers at the site, each thought to represent an individual funeral. The first stone is believed to have been erected in 1657. Although the standing stones are technically grave markers, there isn't anyone buried beneath them. Instead, it's thought that the people they represent are buried in the rock-cut tombs nearby. The whole site is the work of the native Toraja culture, which has complicated burial traditions. 
every time a member of the community passed away, a specific stone would be selected from the nearby quarry and dragged to this location. A temporary wooden shelter would then be erected for an animal sacrifice in honor of the deceased, after which the meat of the animal would be eaten. Nobody, not even the modern-day Toraja people, knows why this specific location was chosen. They also don't know why the tradition suddenly began in the 17th century. As you can tell, it's a very mysterious place. Did the Pueblo people of Chaco Canyon, New Mexico, USA have extra fingers and toes compared to the rest of the human race? If not, they must have deliberately painted extra digits onto the hand and footprints they decorated the walls of their homes with. And that's even stranger. A survey carried out by researchers on the remains of Pueblo people has indicated that a higher than average number of them had polydactyli, the presence of additional digits but the genetic abnormality still accounted for far fewer than one-tenth of them. If five-digit handprints and footprints appeared on the walls of Pueblo homes, there wouldn't be an issue. Because only the six-digit prints exist, archaeologists theorize that people with additional fingers and toes were viewed as having been gifted by something special by the gods. A five-fingered person might invite a six-fingered person to come and place their handprints on their home because they'd view it as a form of blessing. The Pueblo people lived in the high desert area of the canyon a little over 1,000 years ago, and there's still a great deal we don't know about them. In fact, finding out that they revered people with polydactylile is as much as we know about their religion. When the police aren't able to solve a murder in a timely fashion, the investigation might be continued by a cold case squad. It would take the best cold case squad in the world to solve a 2,300-year-old murder. But let's see what we can work out. This is Cloney Coven Man. He died a violent death in County Meath, Ireland during the Iron Age, after which his remains were thrown into a peat bog. The peat has done an outstanding job of preserving his body, so much so that all of his internal organs are still present, along with his skin and hair. Sadly, we don't have any of his body below the waistline. That was destroyed by the same peat harvesting machine that found him. Based on a study of his remains, he was around 30 when he died, stood just over 5 feet tall, and had crooked teeth. The sides of his head were shaven, with the hair on top allowed to grow long and then folded into a pointy shape, almost like a modern mohawk. Before he met his end, he was subjected to extreme torture, including the severing of his nipples. That might be the definitive clue. Nipple sucking was a sign of submission to an Iron Age king in Ireland. So Cloney Coven Man might be a deposed king deemed unworthy of any further tribute of this kind. We don't know much more about Tomb KV-55 in the Egyptian Valley of the Kings today than we did when archaeologists opened it in 1907. The one body found inside the tomb has never been identified, and that's just the start of the problem. The body was found surrounded by artifacts and grave goods, but they all appear to be associated with different people. There's a gilded wooden shrine inscribed with a dedication to Queen Tai in one place, but there are also a pair of clay bricks marked with the name Akhenaten. The casket is marked with the cartouche of Queen Kia, but its occupant is male. If there's a clue to be found anywhere here, it's the fact that the DNA of the male is very similar to the DNA of Tutankhamun. That means it could be Shmenkare, Tutankhamun's brother. Shmenkare was to be the heir to Akhenaten, so a connection with him makes sense too. The presence of items connected to Queen Kia and Queen Taiyi remains unexplained. It's almost as if someone hastily threw a corpse and a load of mixed up burial goods into a tomb thousands of years ago and then sealed it up before anyone found out what they'd done. Music has been central to the culture of every civilization in human history. It was especially important to the Maya, who made a variety of wind and percussion instruments, including primitive trumpets. But their humble whistles might be the strangest musical instruments they ever made. They're often shaped like animals, 
and in some cases, they make sounds similar to the animals they represent. For example, a collection of frog-shaped whistles were found at the Mexican site of Yaxchilian in Chiapas in 1990, and when blown, noted to sound like frogs. The use of such whistles was widespread, with instruments found at Mayan sites in Honduras, Belize, Guatemala, Peru, and Ecuador. In some cases, archaeologists have even found whistles shaped like human beings. Somewhat unpleasantly, they suspect that these particular whistles were used during human sacrifice ceremonies. The shape of each whistle was clearly important to the Maya, with each animal or human shape presumably serving a specific purpose. As for what these specific purposes were, sadly we have no idea. We can speculate that the human-shaped whistles were used in sacrifices and the frog-shaped whistles may have summoned the rain god, but speculation is all we have. Subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications, and you will be the first to know when a new video comes out. Thank you for watching and see you soon.